Hello, everybody. My name is Tom Dick. I'm a uh, mathematics professor at Oregon State University. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have an opportunity to present this guest lecture on parametric functions in the plane. Um, this is a topic that really lends itself to the use of technology. So I'm going to be using a uh, couple of uh, computer emulators of uh, some handheld devices from Texas Instruments. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and make a transition to those now. So here we go. Um, this is uh, uh, unit nine and we're looking at particle motion in the plane. And here is our agenda for uh, today's presentation. It's, uh, we're gonna start out with doing a bit of review of the calculus of rectilinear motion. Uh, that term rectilinear just really means motion along a straight line. And what we're going to be doing is drawing some comparisons between that previous study of rectilinear motion to this new topic of particle motion in the plane. Then we'll look at uh, plotting parametric functions. So these are actually coordinate functions, functions for x of t and y of t as functions of time. We'll draw a uh, distinction between intersections and collisions. I'll say a little bit more about that. And we'll look at some ways of using parametric plots. Um, and then we'll get to the calculus of parametric functions. So we're going to revisit a lot of the topics from rectilinear motion and revisit them in the context of these new functions in the plane. So we'll look at velocity, speed, and acceleration. Uh, we'll also revisit the chain rule and look at how we can use that to find slopes and equations of tangent lines, parametric curves. And we'll also revisit the fundamental theorem of calculus and look at the topics of displacement and distance travel for parametric motion. All right. So to start out, we're going to look at some calculus of rectilinear motion, motion along the straight line, and review that. Uh, one of the more popular letters used to represent position of an object at time t for rectilinear motion is the letter S. I really don't know the history behind that, but if S of t is the position of an object at time t, um, we then use that as our function name and talk about things like velocity, acceleration, displacement, and so forth. Now, if the line that you're working with happens to be the x-axis or the y-axis, that position function might be called x of t or y of t, respectively. All right, so let's get on to our review. So if s of t is that position function, giving us the position of the object along, along the line at time t, then v of t is going to be the first derivative of that s function, s prime of t, and that's the velocity at time t. And if we take yet another derivative, in other words, we do take the derivative of our velocity function, which would be the second derivative of the position function, that's going to give us the acceleration at time t. Now the sign of the velocity function is significant. It could be either positive or negative, but it's actually telling us or indicating the direction of motion along the line. So for example, along a horizontal line, a movement to the right would be considered positive most often, and negative to the left, a vertical line, positive would be motion upwards, negative would be motion downwards. Now the absolute value of the velocity is the speed. We can think of that as the magnitude of the velocity. And that's a little bit of a difference with our everyday language. I think most people just when they're talking, they'll use the term speed and velocity interchangeably. Uh, but there is a distinction to be made here. Okay, so the speed will always be non-negative. It's the absolute value of the velocity, while the velocity could be either positive or negative. Okay. 
All right, uh, some other topics from rectilinear motion that we'll be revisiting. The displacement is another term for simply the change in position. So if we're looking at the displacement between times t equal a and time t equal b, that would be given simply by taking the difference of the positions, s of b minus s of a. Uh, however, if you were given the velocity function, notice that you could use the fundamental theorem of calculus to recover that displacement by just integrating the velocity from a to b, the velocity function, that would also give you the displacement. Now, a key distinction to make, it's kind of similar to the distinction between velocity and speed, is the distinction between displacement and the total distance traveled. Uh, so let's uh, illustrate the distinction between displacement and total distance traveled uh, with a little illustration here we've set up on the next screen. Uh, you see that point at the origin. Um, what I'm going to do is move it along the x-axis. And my question would be is what's the displacement and what's the distance traveled between the initial position, which is the origin, and where I end up. Okay. And to illustrate that, I'm going to make use of something called uh, geometry trace. And what this is going to do is just leave a trail of my motion as I move that particle. I'm going to move it. So I'm moving this point to the right. So I get to four. And then I'm going to back up. Move to negative two. And that's where I'll end up. And my question is, uh, what's the displacement from my original position at the origin? And what's been the distance traveled? Well, the displacement is really just negative two because I started at zero, I ended up at negative two. So if we're going to answer the question of displacement, we would just type in negative two here. That's been the displacement. The distance traveled though, okay, let's uh, retrace our steps. So we started at zero, we went over here to four, then we reversed direction and went all the way back to negative two. That's been a total distance of four plus six backwards is 10. So our distance traveled has actually been So that's the distinction between displacement is really the change in position from the beginning to the end. Distance traveled is the actual distance that you've moved over that interval. Okay. So now we're ready to move on to uh, the topic at hand, plotting parametric functions. Uh, these are functions where both X and Y, the coordinates of the location of a particle moving in the plane, are given as functions of time t. Right. So an example we could consider is this one here. Suppose we wanted to plot the path of a moving particle whose position is given by these two coordinate functions. The x of t is six times cosine of t, and y of t is four times the sine of t. And we're going to do that for the interval from zero to two pi, the time interval. All right, let's take a look on the next page here of th that plot. And now we can see that this is actually an ellipse. It's an ellipse with a major axis of total length 12, because it extends from negative six to positive six, and a minor axis of length, total length eight. Um, notice down here, I've got my X and Y coordinates. Our starting position here is six comma zero. 
and that's at the time t equals zero. And if I trace along this parametric path, notice there's really three values of interest here. We've got the x and y coordinates of our position, but there's also the time value. So this is telling us not only where we're at, but when we're at that location, okay? And so one of the things that we're seeing is that parametric plots allow us to plot some curves that we would take a couple of functions. Notice this, this curve does not pass what's called the vertical line test. But we can, with this simple pair of parametric functions, plot that ellipse very nicely. Uh, and by the way, that those coefficients of six and four, uh, you can generalize that and plot lots of kind, lots of different ellipses uh, centered at the origin of the size of the major and minor axis that you want. Okay. Okay. So parametric functions really provide you tremendous flexibility for plotting interesting curves. Um, Here's another example that on its surface doesn't look much more complicated than the one we used for plotting an ellipse. Um, but I think we might be surprised by what this looks like. So this pair of parametric functions for x of t and y of t respectively are four times the sine of 2t, four, so four times the sine of 3t over this interval from zero to two pi. Let's take a look at what this graph looks like. Wow, so we've got this thing. Uh, this curve is doing some uh, multiple loop de loops here. Um, and to get a sense for uh, how this path is traced out, um, let's go ahead and turn on our trace. And again, it's giving us, we can see that at time t equals zero, we actually started at the origin, okay? And that's easy enough to kind of verify plug in t equals zero into your two coordinate function and you will get zero, zero. Now, as we advance, we can see the direction of motion along this curve because at the origin, it's not clear maybe which loop this takes off from first. See, as we march through our domain of time from t values from zero to two pi, kind of interesting curve being traced out. And then we end back at our starting point. Now, if you're looking at uh, two moving particles, uh, their paths could intersect, uh, but we'd like to make a distinction between a simple intersection point of two curves. And if we're really talking about paths of two moving particles, a different question would be whether or not they collide. In other words, are they at the same location at the same time? Now to illustrate this idea, I'm actually gonna switch over to a different grapher. I'm gonna actually take advantage of the TI-84. And it's just a chance to show how you can use uh, parametric functions on different platforms. Uh, most graphing calculators and graphing software will have some kind of functionality for plotting parametric functions. So here we are on the TI-84. Uh, if I go to the Y equals menu, Normally what you would see on a y equals menu is it's set up for function plotting. And in this case, we wanna do parametric plots. So I'm going to go to the mode and you can see on that uh, fifth line down as function, parametric, polar, and sequence. I'm going to change over to the parametric form now when I return to my y equals menu, what I have here, I've 
gone ahead and kind of preloaded these for this particular illustration. I've got two different particles. Each one has a pair of parametric functions describing its location as a function of time t. So my first particle is this pair, x1t, y1t. It's sine of pi times t over two, cosine of pi times t over two. My second particle has this pair of parametric functions describing its location. It's two minus t and three minus t for y. Okay. Now, when you're plotting parametrically, uh, if we go to our window settings, you'll notice that there's actually, besides the dimensions of the window, and in this case, I've gone ahead and set my window for the x min, x max, y min, y max to a convenient size. But I wanted to point out that we actually need an interval for our t values. I believe we were looking at t values running from zero to four in this example. So I'm going to T min is already zero. I'll change the T max to four. And let me make my T step size. Uh, I'll make it 0.2. What that means is it'll increment by 0.2 for each point it plots. Okay, let's go ahead and graph this and see what we get. And there we get the two plots of the two particles. Uh, now, this is showing us the end plots. And so I see um, that first particle in blue, uh, it's tracing out a circle of radius one, while the other particle whose path is colored red was moving along a straight line segment. Uh, so we can readily see two intersection points of these two curves, but is either one of those intersection points actually a collision point? In other words, are the two particles at the same point at the same time? Well, let's check that out by using the trace. So we'll turn on the trace, it starts out on the blue curve. Ah, uh, notice that we start out on the blue curve at time t equals zero, we're right at the point zero one. That makes sense. We can look at the two parametric functions. The sine of zero would be the x value, cosine of zero or one would be the y value. So zero one is where this curve is starting. Is that the starting point for the particle whose path is measured in red? Well, let's switch over. And the answer is clearly no is that the particle whose path is red is starting up here in the upper right corner of our screen. And so those two, even though the two paths intersect at zero comma one, it's not occurring at the same time. At time t equals zero, these two points are at quite different places. Now I'm going to uh, trace the red particle, and we're getting close to, oh, looks like now we're right on that intersection point of zero comma one. Where is, that's at time t equal two. Where is the blue particle at that time? So I'll switch over to the blue particle. Nope, that's not a, it's still not a collision point. Notice that the blue particle had moved down to the bottom of the circle here at zero negative one. All right, let me keep tracing. Now I'm on the blue path again, and I've gotten to the point negative one comma zero at time t equal three. And that's an intersection point of the two curves, but are the two particles there at the same time? Well, let's change the trace over to the red particle and indeed they are. So this is a true collision point. So the two particles are at the same point at time t equal three. And that point is negative one zero. So that's the, the distinction between a, an intersection point, which is really just a place where two curves cross versus an actual collision point. Now we're talking about the motion of two particles. Are they at the same location at the same time? 
Okay, so I'm going to switch back over to uh, the TI Inspire. And this was the example that we just looked at. Uh, and our answer to that question, to do the two particles ever collide? Our answer was yes, at time t equal three. Uh, just a couple of notes before we go into some calculus, parametric functions, you can actually use them to plot regular y equal f of x function graphs by just using x of t equal t and y of t equal f of t. Uh, what's kind of neat about this is you can then very readily graph the inverse relation to f by switching those two parametric uh, function expressions, make x of t equal to f of t and y of t equal to t and you'll get a nice plot of the inverse relation. Now, whether or not it's actually a function, uh, you'll, you'll need to consider, okay? Now, parametric functions can also be used to plot polar functions. So if you have a function of the form r equals f of theta, you can plot that parametrically by setting x of t equal to f of t times cosine of t and y of t equal to f of t times sine of t. So, I think of parametric functions as your kind of your wild card plotter. Uh, you can plot basically all types of curves parametrically. And so they really provide a lot of flexibility. Okay, let's turn to the calculus of parametric functions. And this is where we will, um, you know, look back at that quick review we did of rectilinear motion, motion along a straight line and see how these two compare. So if you have the position of a particle being given by a pair of parametric functions, x of t comma y of t, then the velocity is actually going to be a vector. It will have two components. It's going to have an, an x component and a y component. And these are simply the derivatives of our two coordinate functions with respect to t. So it'll be x prime of t comma y prime of t. Similarly, our acceleration, we'll take the derivative once again. So that'll be the second derivative of x with respect to t and the second derivative of y with respect to t. And that will give us our acceleration vector. Now here's where things really get interesting. Remember that speed is the magnitude of velocity or absolute value in the rectilinear scenario. Well, speed is also the magnitude of the velocity for parametric functions, except it's also a scalar. In other words, it won't be a vector. And the magnitude of the velocity will get by squaring the two velocity components, summing them up and taking the square root. Now I've used the absolute value signs again around the vector p e of t. Depending on the book that you're using, you'll see that that same that absolute value notation used for parametric equations. You might see a double bar used. So the notation can vary. Here I'm using the same absolute value notation we used for uh, just one dimension on the rectilinear motion to represent this magnitude of the velocity. Okay. So speed is a scalar, velocity is a vector. Now here's a question for you to ponder. Could a particle be moving in the plane at constant speed and yet have a non-zero acceleration? Normally we think of acceleration, you're either speeding up or slowing down and somehow you're velocity is changing, but if you're going at constant speed, could you actually have a non-zero acceleration? Well, let's look at a particular example and see what, what happens. Uh, here's a really simple one, x of t comma y of t. My position functions are given by three cosine of t, three sine of t. And we're gonna look at that for the interval, time interval zero to two pi. Uh, let's take a look at what that graph looks like. Oh, it's simply a circle of radius three. Okay. But remember, this is actually the path of a moving particle. 
And to get a sense for that, that's where uh, on any of these parametric plots, the trace is a really nice tool. So there we see that our particle at time t equals zero is starting out at three comma zero. And as we move around the circle, it's actually moving counterclockwise around the circle. So there's our parametric plot. I won't trace too far there. Now let's go to our question. Let's see, here's our pos original position functions, three cosine of t, three sine of t. The velocity would be given by, it's gonna be a vector whose components are x prime of t and y prime of t. These are simple differentiations to do. We'll get negative three sine of t and three cosine of t for x prime of t and y prime of t respectively. Now let's calculate the speed. Remember that's going to be the magnitude of that velocity vector. So I'll square x prime of t and y, square y prime of t, sum those up and take the square root. In this case, let's see, negative three sine of t squared plus three cosine of t quantity squared I'm going to get uh, nine sine squared plus nine cosine squared. I've gone ahead and factored out the nine. Ah, sine squared plus cosine squared. That sounds familiar. That's just one. So my speed, no matter what time I'm looking at, it's going to be the square root of nine or three. That means that this is, a particle is moving around that circle at a constant speed. But clearly the acceleration is not zero. We take the second derivative or the derivative of the velocity. Notice that our acceleration has components negative three cosine of t and negative three sine of t. How can we explain that? Well, simply enough, acceleration is going to give us the rate of change of the velocity. While the velocity's magnitude is not changing, its direction certainly is. And so the acceleration is capturing the change in the velocity's direction, even though the velocity always has the same magnitude. Kind of a nice way to illustrate that graphically. I've got my same parametrically drawn circle here that we had before. Uh, but what I've done now is I've added a velocity vector if it's in green and an acceleration vector in pink or magenta, whatever color that is. And now as I advance the value of t, we can see that that velocity vector is tangent to the circle but it always has the same length. And the pink acceleration vector, notice that it's always pointing directly toward the origin. If you've ever heard of centripetal force, this is closely related to that. In fact, it's exactly what's going on as we move around the circle. Okay. All right, let's look at some other topics. This one I'll call the chain rule revisited, uh, slopes and tangent lines to parametric curves. Let's recall chain rule. I'm actually gonna use the Leibniz form for this. If y is a function of x and x is a function of t, well then y by composition is a function of t. And in Leibniz notation, it has a really appealing form. We can write down dy dt is equal to the product of dy over dx times dx over dt. Uh, when we're dealing with parametric functions, it's uh, really nice if we've got values for dy dt and dx dt is to reformulate the chain rule into this form. Notice if you solve for dy dx, it's going to be equal to dy dt divided by dx dt. And that's particularly convenient when you're dealing with parametric functions. 
So to find the slope of a curve given by parametric functions at time t equal a, you can calculate the velocity components at that time and take the quotient of the y component over the x component. And that would give you the slope of the curve at that point, at that time. And then it's a simple step to move from there. We could actually get an equation of the tangent line, the curve. Let's see, we need the slope, which we have now, and one point. Well, the point is given by our position functions. So the y coordinate would be y of a, the x coordinate x of a. So we can use our usual point slope form to put together an equation for a tangent line to a curve that's plotted parametrically. Uh, we'll do an example of that here in just a bit, but let's also uh, kind of revisit the fundamental theorem of calculus and talk about displacement versus arc length and distance travel. Uh, now displacement, as you recall, in the rectilinear case is change in position. But with parametric functions, we're gonna have two components. Displacement's gonna be a vector. So between times t equal a and t equal b, it's the displacement will just be the change in both components put together as vectors. So the first component would be x of v minus x of a, that's the x component of the change in position. And then y of b minus y of a would be the y component of the displacement. But here's where the fundamental theorem comes in. If you're given the velocity components, x prime and y prime of t, then you could use the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the displacement components. So x of b minus x of a will be given by the integral from a to b of the x component of the velocity the y of b minus y of a displacement be the integral from a to b of the y component of the velocity. Now, just rearranging this a little bit, if you were given an initial position of a moving particle at time t equal a, and you know the velocity functions of that moving particle, then you can use those pieces of information to find the position of the particle at any other time t equal b. Now these are really just the same two equations we had from the fundamental theorem of calculus, but just rearranged to some simple algebra. So x of b would be x of a, our initial value, plus the displacement between time t equal a and time t equal b of the x component. That's our integral from a to b x prime of t dt. And similarly, we can find y of b by taking y of a plus the displacement in the y component, found by a definite integral of the y component of the velocity. All right. Uh, now, displacement is a vector. But the total distance traveled, which is actually equivalent to the arc length of the path of the moving particle, is going to end up to being just a number. Uh, and so just like we integrated speed to get the total distance traveled in the rectilinear case, we do exactly the same thing here for the particle motion case. We want the total distance traveled. We'll integrate the speed function which is that square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared over the time interval from t equal a to t equal b. And again, I wanna emphasize that's exactly the same as if you were interested in the length of the curve that was traced out by this particle, uh, that would be the arc length. So let's wind up with, um, doing some of these calculations for that interesting curve we looked at just a little while ago. That was our x of t comma y of t was four sine of two t, four sine of three t over the interval of zero to two pi. Remember that's the one that did the loop the loop. Uh, and let's ask a couple of questions here. Uh, what's the equation of the tangent line of this curve at time t equal pi over three? And what's the total distance traveled by a particle moving on this path? over that entire time interval, zero to two pi. Let's look at 
the part A, first of all. So here's our position function. To find that tangent line, uh, first of all, let's find out what point we're at on the curves. We'll simply plug in time pi over three into our position function, or functions, I should say, plural. And we get the point two square root of three comma zero. That's the point that the location we're at at time pi over three. Now we're gonna use the chain rule to figure out the slope of the curve at that point. So I'll take the derivative with respect to t to get my velocity components. And those will be eight cosine of two t, 12 cosine of three t. And then, oh, a little bit of a typo here and correct that right there. At time pi over three, let's see, we'll do y prime of pi over three. That'll be 12 times the cosine of three times pi over three. That's where we're getting this 12 times cosine of pi. And that will be divided by x prime of pi over three. That will be eight times the cosine of two pi over three. See, cosine of pi is negative one. So that will be negative 12 in the numerator. Cosine of two pi over three is negative a half. So we'll get a negative four in the denominator. All the arithmetic clears out. We end up with a slope of three. We have one point, we have the slope. We put that all together. And I've actually plotted the curve again. And this would be the equation of our tangent line down here, three times the quantity x minus two square root of three. And we can see visually what a nice job it does. Now, here's an interesting thing. You may be looking at this and say, well, wait a second, uh, the curve crosses itself. Couldn't there be a tangent line that kind of goes down from left to right? Well, let's go ahead and trace. And I'm going to trace along that loop-to-loop -loop curve until I get to pi over three. Uh, let's see, can I put in pi over three, get there exactly. Ah, boom, there we are. And notice that the, the point was coming down this curve like this. So that is the correct tangent line. So that's an interesting thing that can have a parametric curve could cross itself and the tangent line will depend not only on the location, but also the time. That's a really interesting kind of nuance there. And our very final thing we'll take a look at is that was the total length of that, that curve. And so you can see what I've done here is I've taken the x prime of t, squared it, y prime of t, squared that, taken the square root. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, you probably won't be able to do either with computer algebra or finding an antiderivative. So we've just done a numerical interval here and gotten a total length of that curve of 61.1575 approximately, of course. Okay. Well, uh, that kind of winds up this kind of uh, quick look at parametric functions in the plane. Uh, you can see kind of the uh, really clear analogies to uh, rectilinear motion, motion along a straight line, uh, but also we've seen some of the important differences and nuances. As you saw with parametric functions, I uh, really made quite a bit of use of a grapher. Uh, so I wanna uh, thank Texas Instruments uh, for allowing me to use their TI-84 emulator and their TI-Inspire teacher software to illustrate this stuff for you. So again, thank you so much. Bye-bye.